uh, welcome, welcome those coming into our webinar at the EnviroHouse webinars. It's Saturday morning, nice and gray for me. Um, hope everyone's got their their morning beverage and something to take notes with because there's some good information today about yard composting with our good friend John Inch. Uh, as you're getting filtering in, there's a lot of people here today, so we're going to let everyone give give them a few moments to get in here. Their bowl of cereal ready. Um, You'll notice that you are muted and you don't have video, which is the way we're gonna run this. So just so you know, if you do wanna communicate, we have several options. You can use the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. You can select that. So you can ask questions uh, that way and we'll try to answer them on the air or on, on the show live or in text on that. Also, you can use the chat where you can communicate with other uh, pan uh, attendees as well as the panelists here and we'll answer questions in there. And you might have to give some responses to our polls or if you have you know, something to say. If you open your chat, you'll notice it says to all panelists. I want you to select that, change it to all panelists attendees. And I see thank, someone's already thanked us for saying good morning. So I'll say good morning and welcome. And you should all see that. That's where you're gonna chat with us. Uh, it'll chat with me, Gator, in individuals and I can send out information from there. If you miss any part of this or if there is something where you have to run off or if you just want to watch this again, because there's going to be great information, you can watch this. It is being recorded. We are going to put it on the EnviroHouse Workshops webpage, which is cityoftacoma.org slash workshops. And I'll put that in the, uh, in the chat. And, and we this want is where to you can... Note, Gator, we what? want to note that it takes a little while for us to go through the hoops to get it downloaded and through the right channels to get it uploaded again That's so absolutely may not correct. be up there for at least a week now while you're waiting for this webinar to show up on that you can also watch some older webinars that we've done already including the ones we did last week which were about chickens and ducks and building a coop and prior to that recycle right campaign with our friend preston and friends and so there's a lot of great information there um and I'm going to let Janda talk about what's coming up, and then I'll come back and we'll do a quick poll so you see how that works. So go ahead, Janda. Okay. So next week we are doing um, heat pumps on the 27th. We'll be doing heat pumps for heating and cooling. And we'll also be talking about heat pump water heaters, which are becoming more and more popular and can save some money and be more efficient. Um, the following week on the third, we will be doing gardens, starting your garden. Um, that will be with Jenny again, for those of you that have been in on some of the others, um, Jenny Call representing Garden Sphere. Um, that will be um, a little bit intro on doing raised beds and a little bit on soil, just basically what your amendments are. And then mostly just on gardening itself. Um, what you can plant, what grows well here, how to take care of it, and a little bit on pest management. So that's on April 3rd. And then in April, um, we're, we are in the process of putting together like probably a couple a week, um, along with a lot of other activities because the sustainability office and the EnviroHouse and the Enviro Challengers are all working together um, to do a whole month of Earth Month instead of just Earth Day. So there will be a lot of new, um, new opportunities and, that we'll be sharing with you. And also, if there are any of these things that you want to see, sometimes the links are kind of hard to remember. And I found that if you just do cityoftacoma.org forward slash and then put the name of the area you want, if you do forward slash EnviroHouse, forward slash EnviroChallengers, forward slash sustainability, you can come up with the web page for each of those areas. It also works for urban forestry if you want more on pruning and trees and what have you. So um, that's basically what I have, I think, this morning. If I think of anything else, I'll throw it in the chat. And um, do you want it back, Gator, or are we yeah. going to be done? Excellent. Um, OK, so as we said, sometimes during this, you can inter interact through a poll. And I'm gonna show you what that is. I want you to answer this poll and they're all anonymous. So you don't have to be fearful of it. I'm gonna put up a post on how did you hear about this? And this is how this will work is I'm gonna put this up here and you can select one of these. Did you hear about it on Facebook, EnviroHouse webpage, EnviroNews, Tacoma Sustainability, work email, family, friends, colleague, other, okay? 
I know I heard about it from, I probably heard of it from my friends here at the, at the e-house, Janda. So uh, go ahead and I'll give you guys roughly 30 to 40 seconds, maybe a minute to answer these questions and then uh, we'll take a look at it. 77% of you have voted. So a few more of you jump in there, vote early, vote often. Um, I'll end the polling so we can take a look at it and we can look at our data really quickly and you'll see how this works. So John during his presentation will ask you a question and you can answer it and we'll see how people have heard about it. So it looks like our Facebook posts are pretty, uh, actually getting some, getting some interest and that's important. So excellent, glad you guys are answering these questions. And before I turn it over to John, I want to also say, what was I gonna say? I missed it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so never mind. I'm sure it'll come to me later. So let's turn it over to John. Today we're here about yard composting. John, go ahead and take it away. Hey, everybody. How's it going today? Hope you're having a great day out there. It is uh, gray where I'm at as well. And so it is a perfect day for us to be inside, uh, I guess, staring at our screens and learning about some composting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen here so that we can uh, begin our presentation. All right. One more click away. Here we go. Uh, so today we're here to talk about compost. Uh, yeah, the rind is a terrible thing to waste. So uh, we don't want uh, we don't want to lose these valuable, valuable uh, products that we often might toss in the garbage. So um, as I said before, my name is John. Uh, I work in the city of Tacoma in the Enviro Challenger program. Uh, which is a uh, educational program that goes into the classrooms as well as does uh, community events. And uh, we work for our environmental services division, which is made up of surface water, wastewater, uh, and our solid waste program. And so uh, we get to do uh, great programming with our younger members of our community, but then I also have this cool opportunity to do something like this uh, and other team members um, do various different things like our Ask the Enviro Challengers um, program as well. And those are things to check out. Something else that we're working on is a uh, goose chase uh, program for this summer, uh, especially coming up here in the Earth Month. Uh, we are going to do an, a, a month long goose chase. And if you're not familiar with goose chase, it's basically a, 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 an online scavenger hunt um, that you can plug into and use your uh, smart devices, your tablets, um, some points to me, your computer, and log in and participate and do the different challenges that we'll have. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be coming up um, very soon. We'll be getting some advertising out for that. So uh, as we go forward here, um, I just want you to know that I, I've been composting myself for about 10 or 15 years or so with, with some luck, um, but I've, I've had a lot more lessons along the way. Uh, so uh, it's not all been luck. Uh, so uh, I am by no means an expert. Um, I just try really hard to learn uh, from the lessons. And today I'd like to share uh, some of my luck uh, as well as some of the lessons uh, I'm still working on here. So uh, let's keep moving. So composting is really just us managing that natural system uh, that occurs uh, out in the forest. Uh, compost. Composting has been happening for ages and ages and ages. Uh, and it's all these little critters out there in the in the soils that actually work to break everything down. And when they've gone through and they've munched away at all the leaves and all the fallen fruit and all the all the other things that are lying around out in our forest floor, the branches and whatnot, we wind up with compost. And that is the actual material um, after it's gone through a beautiful process of breaking down where there's this great combination of air and heat and oxygen. Uh, and we get this great aerobic activity. Uh, but sometimes you might find some things that, uh, that kind of don't work out so well and they kind of smell bad. Uh, uh, and this is, this is part of where fermentation uh, comes from. And this is the anaerobic where there's not a lot of oxygen going into the process. Uh, it's just a lot of oxygen coming out of the process. So uh, those are some of the things we'll talk a little bit more about as we go. But after things have been composted, we wind up with compost. And I believe we've already addressed our poll question here. Uh, that uh, was the first one. I do have level of experience is the first one I have. Oh, okay, cool. Let's, let's go ahead and start one? with that one. Let's start with that. Yeah, before, we, okay. before I get going, much going, let's, let's go ahead and deal with that. 
All right, well, here's your first question, everybody that's uh, in dealing with compost. What is your level of experience with composting? None an interest in learning, full-time composter, been composting, but have problems. Long-time com composter, first-time caller. Is that the way it works, right? <laughs> Long <-time laughs> listener. So I'll give you about 30 more seconds to jump in there. John, I know you're gonna get to this, but you said you've only been composting for like 10 years, you said 10 to 15 years, but- Well, 10 to 15 years, yeah. But your experience in, with composting goes, and you'll, you'll, I know you address this later. That, so that, gets... that... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got, you got me on that one. You got me on that one. I have a lot to, uh, to credit my dad for from when I was a kid. So sure. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I guess it's been a little bit more than ten or fifteen years here. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, you're only 25, so it's really only been about 20 years. So we're, you know, we're good. <laughs> excellent. So um, I'm going to give Very everybody nice. just 10 more seconds. Uh... And then, yeah, I know I have a lot of questions even after seeing the seminar before, I'm still like not quite ready to commit to doing it the right way. <laughs> All right, well, here's the answers. Let's take a look at those. I'll leave them up for a minute so you can take a look at them. Okay. Very cool. Good info. Thanks, everybody. That's a great split. That's a great split. All right, cool. Well. Let's let's keep moving here. Okay, so you know why do we want to do this? Why do we want to compost? Um, put this work into going outside and collecting our food scraps and things like that. But if you you know up to seventy five percent of the household food waste, you know if we think about all of our meal prep and spoiled food, uneaten leftovers, things the kids won't eat, uh, things buried deep 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 in the freezer don't even resemble what you first put in there anymore. That's all material uh, that often winds up being thrown away. And if, if we were composting, we're going to be reducing the amount of that material that actually goes. And it's estimated that Tacoma, about a tenth of our, our actual garbage is, is actual food waste. So if we're thinking about a, a way to reduce that amount of waste, you know, so instead of tossing it in a, in a, in a garbage can you, can, you can toss it into a pile, and that's going to definitely reduce the landfill waste. And then you're going to create your own your own gardening material. Now, there is another, another aspect here that we can think about is that in the city of Tacoma, within the city of Tacoma, we have our brown bin, and that is for organic material. And so this is another venue for people who are listening in that might not think that they have the capabilities of creating a compost pile or system or even utilizing one of the tumblers. Maybe you live in a, 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 a multi, uh, uh, person home, apartment, duplex, condo. Um, we have a lot of retired uh, assisted living facilities, retired facilities, all sorts of different housing situations that might not be conducive to composting. But if you have a way to utilize a brown bin, there is another way that you can reduce the amount of waste that goes to the landfill. And, and this brown bin material actually does get turned into compost eventually. So there is a, another way that you can use that if you have the, the brown bin in the city of Tacoma. So, um, you know, composting, uh, it saves you money because it's cheaper than buying store-bought compost. Bags of compost can actually get quite expensive. Uh, we're actually uh, going to increase soil structure, um, the aeration of that soil and the fertility. As we think about all the critters that are gonna be moving through the ground to get to the compost or where you put it out on your beds uh, or around your garden, you know, critters that move through and, and work like big tunnelers and furrowers and makes a great space for air and water to get through. But we're also going to be adding things like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, but also some of the micronutrients like calcium, magnesium, and manganese. And these are things that are very important for plants in their building process, especially if anybody's ever had um, blossom end rot on their tomatoes or cucumbers. Uh, those micronutrients, especially calcium and, and, and whatnot, are very important for those plants to help prevent that, that from happening. By using compost, we're actually even uh, feeding all of those little microbes that are down there in the earthworms. You know, there's something like a billion or more microbes in a handful of healthy soil. So they, they, need, they need the energy. So you're, you're helping feed them and keeping the soil healthy. And if you can produce enough compost, uh, it, it can be um, a great way to keep weeds down by smothering the weeds, but you have to make sure that your compost 
starts off weed free. So let's get into some factors that affect composting. This is where I have learned the most. Um, we got this little wheel here that shows uh, some of the various components that go into making compost happen. And um, there is a balance to all of this, as we'll talk about here as we go. And that brings me to my next poll question. All right, let's take a look here. If you have been composting, what kind of problems or issues are you having when you compost? Too wet, too dry, smells bad, doesn't heat up, or other? Go ahead and answer that in the chat. Go ahead and vote, please. I think mine is lazy. I get lazy and I have to, <laughs> that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My dad's got a method for you, Gator. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, looks like half, pe half the people have voted. Don't forget to vote. Uh, I did remember what I wanted to tell everybody earlier. It's it's uh, if you missed any of this webinar or any of our webinars, you can go to uh, Envir our city of Tacoma.org slash workshops and watch it. It'll take us a couple, you know, maybe a week or so to get it up there, maybe longer, but um, you'll be able to watch this and other webinars through that web page there. So go ahead and give it a shot. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer here too. A few more of you need to vote here. You can do it. All right, getting that up there. I'm going to end the polling here in about 10 seconds. Let's see, some people all said agree, lazy and no serious problems, had to answer <laughs> other. Now, that is something that, yeah, some people are just getting it going and it's working great. So, all right, I'm gonna end that poll. Let's take a look at our, as our results come in. Thank you for that, doesn't heat up, smells bad, too dry, too wet, and other, so. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Okay, well, the, the heat up thing is definitely a, a big, a big issue. Um, it's one I actually even struggle with as well. And so um, we'll go ahead and start working on it. And it just so happens that temperatures right off the bat here for us. So um, here in the Northwest, it can be a real challenge uh, to keep a pile at uh, optimum temperatures. So this is when you start to kind of wanting to understand if you were gonna have a hot pile or a cold pile, do some hot composting or cold composting. And this is where the two camps split. So if um, you wanna be a cold composter, you're not really looking to generate temperatures much more than 110 or 115 degrees. So it's gonna be somewhere between like, you know, maybe on the low end, um, 70 or 80 degrees and uh, high end, 110, 115. So in, in this situation, you're not, you're, 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 you're not doing too much with the pile. It's just kind of doing its thing and you're letting time uh, do more of the, the work here. You're just letting nature break things down, whatever little microbes, like worms and beetles and bugs might crawl up into it and break it down. But on the other hand, if you start generating temperatures of 120 to 140 degrees, this is where we start getting into hot composting. And this is where uh, a lot of folks work to be because this is where we're breaking down um, a lot more things in our soil, but this is where it takes a lot more work. Uh, it, it becomes a hot pile because you're turning it and, and getting all of those nutrients back to that core uh, from the outside. So um, it, it, it's helping to aerate, get water in and move things around. But if it was cold, you can see that the, the heat is only gonna be in the central portion. The outside will always, always be kind of chilly. So a hot pile, you're turning it a bit more. Now I talk about temperature, and so uh, you know you're going to need a thermometer. Um, and uh, the, if you have a thermometer to deal with what we've been going through for the last year, that's not going to work. Uh, wrong type of thermometer. Um, this is going to be a long um, composting thermometer, or something like two feet long, uh, 22 inches or something like that. And uh, I got a, I found a little clip here for one. You can see some of the some of the things that. Uh, they can tell you about the pluses of a compost thermometer, but they are also kind of pricey. Um, I've seen these upwards of 30, 35 bucks. I mean, I've seen them down in the twenties as well too. So you can find them locally, places like McClendon sells them. Uh, I think Garden Sphere might, um, Portland Avenue Nursery might, but I know I've seen them at McClendon's before. 
Um, but you can also find a, a candy thermometer uh, or a also called a, to a turkey thermometer because you want something long. But I, I find them often as candy thermometers in the grocery store. They're not quite as long. They're only about a foot long. Sometimes you can find them a little bit longer, um, especially if you were to go to like maybe a restaurant supply store. Um, but these these will work. You just might have to dig a little hole in the compost to get down as deep. And so that way, you know, you can get a, a deeper uh, reading in your pile, but also save some money. And this is for the person who wants to actually track the temperature of the pile, that that hot temperature is very important to them and that, you know, you're going to be very proactive with it. So if you're not interested in, in the temperature and being proactive with it, then that cold composting is perfect for you. And that was my dad's favorite method. Another factor that might uh, go into it is the temperature. Uh, if it gets above 150 degrees, uh, that pile is really cooking. But that, uh, boy, I don't know if that's outside of maybe on uh, the hottest, sunniest days in the summer. I don't think uh, most of us in Washington are really going to worry too much about a pile to get to 150 degrees. But if it does start to get hot, really, you know, just turn it because, you know, you're just going to dissipate that heat and spread things out. You could also hose it down, uh, especially if it gets that hot, it might start getting pretty dry. So you want to make sure that you have uh, a moisture content in there. Um, or if you've got a way of shading it, especially if you're building a, a compost bin system, you might have a, a lid for it that blocks out some of the some of the heat from the day and provide some shade. Air or oxygen is very important. This is what creates the uh, aerobic portion of this decomposition here. And so this is also part of turning that pile as you're making it more uh, uh, oxygen rich because you're, you're folding air into it. You're opening up spaces that might have closed up uh, and creates um, mats and blocks water from getting through the pile or air getting through the pile. Um, and oftentimes when we, when we, our pile smells bad, it's because there isn't enough oxygen. And so this happens when we use a lot of uh, green grass, uh, especially wet green grass in particular, it kind of blocks. And so um, sometimes what I do with my grass and I have a large portion of grass uh, to mow out here, um, I will pile it separately and then add that um, to my compost uh, a bit here and there. Grass is a little tricky because at first it's, uh, it's one of those um, nitrogen rich products, one of the greens. So it's a great hot product, but too much, you know, it's one of those things, too much of a good thing. And this is, this is a lesson I've learned on my piles quite often is when, when I start to smell the pile is bad, I, I can get in there and notice that I've, I've got this wet layer that's blocking air from getting through. So as far as what that, that, that pile should feel like, that moisture in the pile should feel like, you know, they, they got these numbers about 50%, but I often find that we do a much better job with uh, our, our hand feel. And so that's the wet sponge picture there, uh, especially if you're using it to wipe down the kitchen table. You know, you don't want to leave a trail of water behind. You want to pick up crumbs and leave no evidence. So, uh, you know, it's just want to, you just want it to be damp. Um, another analogy could be like the towel after you've showered and dried off, the way that that towel feels damp, um, you know, you don't, you're not wet, but it's, it's damp. Uh, so it's kind of how you want your compost to feel. Um, it, it shouldn't be something that clumps up into a ball. If it's clumping up into a ball, it's too moist. If it absolutely crumbles apart, it's too dry. And so again, there's that balancing act. You might have to cover it with a tarp during the rainy months around here, which is a long period of time. Uh, but that will also even help generate heat in the winter months, so it can kind of balance out well for you. Another factor is going to be our balance of materials in the pile. Um, and for those of you out here uh, who love the math, this is the math portion for you. You can see we've got some ratios there, some numbers to work out. X equals this, that, and the other thing. So. Um, I, I will simplify this by just simply saying that, you know, this, the, the thing to take away from our, our, our equations here is that we want to make sure that we have a few more browns, a few more carbons. And you can see our high carbon materials are things like straw, hay, wood, dry grass, uh, paper waste, um, old corn stalks, things like that. They work out pretty well. Um, wood chips, you can see, is pretty high in the, uh, in the ratio there. So, 
um, you gotta you gotta watch out for having too many wood chips in your pile, especially if you're a backyard uh, chicken keeper. Uh, and you're using um, wood chips as a bedding, you can often overload the pile with with the wood chips there. So um, it it is a bit of a balancing act. And then our green materials or those um, the high nitrogen materials are, are going to be green grass clippings. Um, and some of our food scraps. You know, this can be out of the garden, can be out of the refrigerator, um, leftovers. Watch out for putting anything in your pile with leftovers that has sauces or things like that. You don't want to attract any unwanted guests. Or maybe maybe you do. Maybe you want to find out what kind of critters roam your neighborhood. So that's one way to do it. Could test the efficacy of your spaghetti sauce that didn't work. That's right, right. <laughs> Who else likes my spaghetti sauce? <laughs> right. Oh, it's a pesto yeah. tonight. It should be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the Browns really quick. Uh, for those of you that are worried about um, your personal financial security and you have bank statements and things like that that are not accepted in our city of Tacoma's recycling anymore, um, your compost pile is a great place to get rid of it. Because I guarantee you, once it's gone through a worm's gut, there's no way you're going to be able to glue it back together and steal any info. The other side, uh, the other thing to watch out for is you want to make sure you keep your compost chemical free. So we want to keep any materials out. If you spray your lawn um, with any sort of herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, those clippings can't, they can't go in your, um, they actually can't even go in your brown bin. They don't want those in the brown bin either. Um, and they can't go in your, um, compost. Uh, it will definitely have a, a, an effect. Um, so we, we just want to try to watch out and make sure that this material that we're making stays as chemical free as we can possibly, possibly, possibly keep it. So uh, it's something to watch out for. It might be a, a change in the way that you uh, address your yard, but if you're going towards using compost, you are probably starting to make a shift towards um, more natural products uh, and less uh, harmful chemicals. So um, the process that really that really is up to you. Um, you know, if you want something in a couple of weeks, I have a I have a really old book that I bought, uh, like a little pamphlet type book, where there was a guy who talks about composting uh, being done in, in 14 days, uh, hot compost done in 14 days. And I read the book and uh, talked to quite a few people, and they're like, "Yep, it's all it's all there. It, you, you're turning the pile every day." And you're, you're doing all of the work to make sure that, that, that everything's incorporated uh, and the balancing act is pretty spot on, that you're not out of balance one way or the other, that the moisture's right and, and everything. And so that's, a, that's, the, that's the far end of that, that spectrum, right? And then, the, and then you can see that we said two years here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually take that a step further and, and tell you that my, my dad would tell you that you can go much, much, much longer than two years. Um, when I was a kid growing up, my parents had an opportunity to uh, get a larger a larger space and they, they wound up with uh, about an acre and uh, we had this back portion that was just kind of woody and uh, my dad would take all the grass clippings all summer long and just throw them in a pile all the leaves all the sticks all the twigs everything and put them in that pile back there and uh, when we had a garden he would take all the all the scraps all the bad veg and everything that was not good and uh, spoiled he'd put it in that pile and you know and as we grew up and we were mowing the lawn he would you know tell us to throw in a pile and he would start throwing things around like, um, you know, go get me a wheelbarrow of, uh, of uh, you know, 1982. And uh, we, you know, my brother and I were like, what are you talking about? And he had to bring us out and show us this pile. Was, you know, this is from, this is a pile I started in 1982, the year after we moved on to this place. And, and that one over there, that's 83. And uh, we're working on uh, 84 right now. So by the time I graduated from high school, he had piles that ranged from 1982 to 1989 and uh, my brother is still dealing with some of those piles and it's 2021 so you know composting can go for a long time and Gator was right my dad taught me how to compost and a, a bit about it and that was one of those factors I, I kind of forgot about there but um, my dad believed that you know nature will do its job and we just got to dig around a little bit and we'll get the material out of it so um, but if we throw that material in the landfill you can see uh, it may never decompose there's really um, not a lot of oxygen or uh, water getting down in there. Uh, they put layers of material over them um, to block smells out. A lot of us put our garbage in bags and tie them up. So, you know, 
not much is going to break down in those situations. But compost pile, if you got the space, years it could be years. If you want to speed up that uh, process, though, there are a few things that you can try. Uh, this is again, this is something uh, I learned a bit the hard way um, by not making things small enough. I forgot the fact that I am trying to present food to minions of microbes, um, you know, endless worms down there of all various sizes, not just earthworms. There's something like like 3,000 different species of worms in the world, and earthworms are just one variety. Um, when we talk about worm composting, we often talk about the, uh, the little red wigglers um, and the smaller worms in the world uh, because they live more up in the tops of the piles, but are the tops of our lawns and, and ground space. But when we talk about composting, earthworms are a big factor because they burrow down in there. And so all of those small little mouths benefit from having smaller pieces chopped up and thrown in there. Um, I currently uh, operate a farm and my compost pile uh, often I have to go out and chop stuff up because somebody will throw in like a whole, you know, squash vine. And uh, it's like, well, that'll just, that, my dad would love you for that because that goes into that like two year or more methodology. But I, I want to, I want to make this faster. So I end up going out there with a machete and chopping up into smaller pieces. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that you're chopping your stuff up small enough, uh, especially if you're having a small pile in, in the yard. Um, the smaller it is, the quicker uh, the critter will be able to break, break it down and break into it. Uh, and also be aware that some skins on materials are uh, developed for that fruit for a reason. I said fruit because I'm thinking of oranges. Orange peels need a lot of assistance to break down. If you throw the whole orange peel out there, it'll turn green with mold before any other critter breaks it down. It's got citric acid and things that are kind of unappealing to a lot of the small critters. So if you can chop those things up uh, and make them a little bit more discern, uh, indiscernible, they can't identify it or it blends in better and less acidic and they'll be able to shred that stuff up. Um, I find that also crushing my eggshells, they disappear faster versus throwing a, a whole cracked half an eggshell out there. Uh, even in my big compost piles, I still try to break things down in small parts. Um, if uh, you're having some heat issues, you know, you can start balancing the temperature out here. Um, you can go equal parts of greens to browns, but only do this until the pile starts to warm up and get going because after that you'll probably start to smell the excess green materials they can kind of smell um, a little little stronger times those are those when you're starting to smell the decomposing materials john we have a question that fits right in here oh yeah perfect um actually two the first one is can i throw away moldy vegetables in there <laughs> um so i try to uh, I, well, I have big compost piles, so um, you know I, sometimes I'll actually see the fruit go or things or veggies go moldy out there as they're sitting out there. But as a rule, I uh, am, am, when I lived in Tacoma, in my small um, pile in my backyard, I tried to avoid throwing moldy food out there because it was already starting to present odors that unwanted guests might be attracted to. If you have a big enough pile, and we're going to get into the size of the pile here in a little bit. Um, you might be able to bury that. Um, you know, the, the, the molds are not going to necessarily be bad for what's in the ground because part of breaking things down is, is molding. Um, so as we see mold in the refrigerator, it's just spoilage that's occurring in a different kind of bacterium and process that's going on there. More fermentation is happening there, but you can get those out there in the pile. Um, when it comes to worm composting, if anybody is specific about that, we often do avoid moldy food in there because we're very concerned with our worms. So um, we might avoid it in that particular situation. But if you're making a pile and you have the ability to bury that moldy food um, and, and you're active, as you can see, you're turning your pile regularly, that's gonna break down pretty quick. Excellent. Uh, another question is relating to citrus and eggshells. Would it be better to actually blend the citrus peel and the eggshells? Or, <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna go all in, right? Get a tiny, yeah, I mean, if, tiny bits, right? <laughs> if you're willing, if you're willing to go to that extreme, they're not going to say no to it. Uh, it'll it'll break down really quick that way for you. Um, I, you know, I mean, you wouldn't need to throw it in a blender or anything like that. But like, if you wanted to chop your egg, your your uh, your orange peels um, into smaller dimensions, but I don't I don't think you need to like blend it per se. Maybe maybe a julienne instead of or a chiffonade, but not necessarily <laughs> a, a fine ice, right? So. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. you uh, okay, carry on, please. Yeah. 
yeah uh but again turning your pile regularly the more uh active you are with the pile the quicker you are again that little pamphlet the guy was like turn it every day and you'll have crown post for 14 days so um but also let's let's address that too um if you want to do that you have to stop adding things to that pile so you have to get your pile to a size and then start a second pile while you turn this one every single day, because if you keep adding something brand new to the pile every day, at 14 days, the thing you added yesterday is gonna look like the thing you added yesterday. So you'll have to have a second pile. So um, that's where a composting bin system might work out well for you or a tumbler or something like that. So, and again, moisture is important. You want it wet, but not too wet. The pile of things to not put in the pile. Uh, so, you know, um, no meat, this is a great way to find, uh, all the unwanted visitors, all the unwanted, uh, critters in your neighborhood. Um, you know, I think you can see pretty much the list here, um, no bones, no diseased plants. So again, that's not moldy. That's just diseased. Um, so if you've got aphids or mites or things like that, you don't want to put that pile there. Uh, you don't throw grease and fat in there. It just doesn't break down very well, and it actually goes rancid pretty quick. Use kitty litter. That's gross. I've actually had, had people bring that up before. I mean, there's there's cat waste in there. And, um, and then, you know, we have to think about where what is the litter, where did it come from, what are they using to make it, those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to newspapers and circulars, uh, colored ones are out. They're still using certain toxic inks for those. Um, so I usually eliminate my flyers and put those in the recycling bin. Uh, anything with like uh, large amounts of black ink too, I often try to avoid that. So I just try to stick with my, my general um, grocery store adverts, um, except for the, the colored ones, I guess, on those um, and just the newspaper, but I don't get a lot of newspaper too much anymore. So that one's not a big issue for me. Uh, uh, again, if you're- on, oh. Sorry, on, on the newspapers, I know some newspapers actually use a fish-based ink. And so yeah. if you know that, I guess if you know that's what it is, but it can't be a guarantee, yeah. of course. So. Yeah, I think I think I read something someplace where about 70% of our print papers are on soy based or fish based ink. Um, so even even the color ones are there. So um, but again, you, you have to you have to do your due diligence in that one. So, you know, that, that uh, sometimes it's just easier to make a rule. No color newspaper, but. Uh, you know, if you hey, know, John, you can... we're getting a little weird uh, noise from your speaker. From your okay. microphone, maybe you can right. uh, just mute for a sec and try it again. See if that helps. Sorry about that, everybody. We're working on these things, and then I have some. Uh, yeah, let's see if that worked a little better. How are we doing now? That's better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A little bit of little bit of glitchy uh, static, but I'm not sure where it's coming from. So. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. If it comes up again, let me know. I can switch off the headphone. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I think treated wood's pretty obvious. Um, you know, even if you're trying to be an organic farmer, you can't use treated wood on the farm at all anywhere there. So uh, no treated wood or sawdust from that wood um, right there. So that's that was the sawdust for Sawdust can be used for sure, but you just have to make sure it's not for treated wood. Um, I tend to avoid cheese, milk, butter, dairy products. Those are too tasty to throw in the compost pile. Um, you know, when John, you're we're getting that. Sorry, John, we're getting that that noise again. So if maybe you can, that noise is coming in. So if you can, maybe you said switch off the headphones. Yeah. Maybe is that Thanks. better. Yeah, for now. Thanks. Great. All right. <laughs> yep. Yep. No problem. Um, and again, uh, you want you know if you're trying to use your compost to suppress weeds, you want to make sure that you're not putting weeds in your compost pile, especially if they're about to go to seed or they are in seed phase, like you're pulling dandelions and they're shooting the little uh, parachutes all over. Don't throw that in the compost pile, you know, and don't throw a bunch of seeds in there either, because you're just going to get uh, a great environment for seeds to grow in. Um, and again, just like kitty litter up above, no, no human dog or cat waste. Um, I know that there's uh, talk of things like humanure and pet composting and those are for very specific types of composting and that's not what we're talking about doing because the, the concept here is that we're going to use these things maybe where we're going to be growing vegetables and stuff so we don't want any pathogens or things like that passing around out there um, so we want to avoid that one question did come up uh what about herbivore litter such as guinea pigs or rabbits and then uh, charcoal uh all right, so charcoal I avoid 
Um, you can use wood ash. Uh, again, it can't be from a fire where it was with treated wood. Um, it would be from a fire that was, you know, uh, clean, clean wood that you're burned. So you could use that kind of wood ash, uh, but not charcoal because, um, you know, uh, your Kingsford briquettes and things like that, if they had a, uh, a fire starter used with it, or you'd have to know what it goes into making those, um, those briquettes and whatnot. So I tend to avoid charcoal. Um, what was the other one again? Uh, herb, herbivore litter. Herbivore, yeah, pigs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, guinea pigs, rabbits, uh, their kind of waste uh, is often great compost um, because it is uh, uh, material that is broken down and has been gone through the gut and being breaking down. Just like cow manure, because they're herbivores, um, people often love to use uh, cow manure for composting or put it in the compost pile as well. Um, so those things would be fine uh, in there. Again, if you're using though the, the, the wood shavings as the bedding, um, just make sure that you're watching out for that balance in that. Thank you. And then uh, uh, the, someone added the green parts of some recurring pesky weeds are fine, but avoid the roots from things like dandelions, crabgrass, nettles, and horsetails, because you talked about no seeds. So yeah, the roots are yeah. cru crucial, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you throw them into your compost pile, and that could prove to be a perfect environment for them to go ahead and start rooting up again. So, you know, with those ones, you want to pull them up, let them try out and die out. While we talk about our pile, here's a, a little uh, food web of our compost pile. So you can see all the different kinds of critters you might uh, you might come across in your pile there. For those of you with kids, this is a great one to have with a little, little magnifying glass and sometimes go out there and dig through the pile and root around and see, see what kind of different critters you can find out there. Because when you're just sitting there staring at it in your hand or staring at the pile on the ground, you can't quite see all the residents that are doing this work for you. So um, this is a, a great little breakdown of, of what's happened in there. And this is just this is just a small example of, of what's happened. Like I said, I, I read someplace where there, uh, you know, a billion different microbes in a, in a handful of soil. I'm not sure you switched slides on us there. Let's see if that, maybe it. That one? No, not there. Let me, uh, maybe it froze up on you. Uh -oh. There we go. You're back out. Sorry about this. That's okay. We didn't know. Uh, someone did ask about weeds being composted. Yeah, you want to avoid them. Weeds there. That's just the. Okay. Are we back? Uh, you're in present mode, not presenter, but there you go. There's your microbes, and it's that. But you're in that, yeah, slide mode or with the presenter mode not there you go good so there's all the fun stuff going on down there right all right so brings us to our next poll question excellent thanks sorry for all those interruptions okay so we are looking at what size is your property small city lot mid-sized lot large property an acre or more uh, if you do have another size, you can throw it in the chat if you're not sure. Um, someone did ask about, you know, is this the same list for the brown bin in Tacoma, the stuff you listed? I, it's not necessarily, so I sent a link to the what you can put in your food waste. There's a flyer there in various languages. So I'll um, we'll give you about 20 more seconds. Looks like 80% of the people have already voted. I need to, there we go. That's mine. Second, a minute All for right. a, a split second on that brown bin. Um, yeah. The cool thing about using the brown bin is that the brown bin and composting can go hand in hand because a lot of the things that we don't want to put in our compost pile outside are welcome in the brown bin. Nice. Yeah, we uh, we did an Ask the Enviro Challenger. If you're interested, you can go to uh, our website, which should be available, envirochallenger.com. We did an episode about composting, and there's some fascinating things, what what it does. And you see the big, the the scoopers turn all that stuff. I wish I had that ability. <laughs> the big backhoe thing. So let's look at our poll here and see what people say, where they live. Sorry. So yeah, it's pretty close between small city lot and mid-sized lot. So 
Awesome. Oops, jumping all over here. Okay, uh, that was great. That kind of helps as we move forward. So we're ready to go. We are, go awesome. for it. All right, um, so let's talk about the different types of composting setups here. So uh, this will be where that question becomes important because this kind of varies what we want to do um, with our piles here and how we want to set them up. Uh, this, this right here is very reminiscent of what my dad liked to do. Uh, just make these big piles out there of all the grass clippings and the lawn mowings. He didn't care if it was green grass going out there, uh, green leaves going out there. Uh, he just put that pile out there and make that pile and then just leave it alone. And the next year we'll make another pile and we'll just leave it alone. And we'll, maybe we'll go back and see if there's anything happening in the very core of the first pile. And this just, like I said, went on for years. So my dad really did not want to get out there and turn a pile. Uh, and I, I, I thought, I just thought this was the norm for the longest time until I started talking to people who, who do a lot of composting and they're like, wow, no, there's a lot more activity you can do here. And um, setting those piles up in different systems can be beneficial. So let's, let's talk about some of the different systems. You know, this, this pile here is, is really only going to work if you have a large yard or space to do this in and leave it there and let it go. So this is definitely not for everybody. Uh, you know, when we think about the size of our pile, we really want to think about like how, how our body mechanics are, uh, how we move. Um, so, you know, a three by three by three pile uh, is pretty nice because that's really manageable um, for a person to turn with a pitchfork or some simple tools, a rake, things like that. You start getting bigger than five by five by five and that pile starts to get unmanageable, unruly and uninteresting. Um, and these were the piles my dad created. He created just these epically large piles. And uh, unless you had a tractor, you weren't turning it. And um, here on the farm, I have created uh, a couple of these kinds of piles and they frustrate me <laughs> because they don't, they don't warm up very well. Uh, they take a lot of work to get them get going. And um, they just, it, it just was not the best method to learn first off. So try to create smaller piles. Um, I've had uh, previously when I lived in Tacoma, I used a bin system. I did not follow the three by three method there, but it was pretty close. Uh, I made it more like a sitting bench with three compartments on the inside of it um, that allowed me to uh, turn and collect and turn and collect and stuff like that. So uh, I, I liked the bin system. Uh, but again, I, I can, I, you know, if you have pallets or something like that, you might be able to make some of these bigger ones. Uh, and then when we get into tumblers, um, you know, there's all sorts of different sizes and shapes of them. If you get a chance to get out to the Enviro House um, and check out some of the tumblers that we have on display out there, um, you know, it would be a great opportunity before you go out and buy one uh, at some of our different stores that offer them around. Uh, but as I put a note here, because you're going to keep eating uh, and just like turning a compost pile, uh, at some point you have to stop putting things in the tumbler. And you're going to need either a second tumbler uh, to collect food scraps, or you're going to need like a little garbage can. So that's just something to think about with, with the tumblers. Kind of similar to the bin system um, that we'll show you here in a little bit. Here you got three different compartments or so to choose from. Uh, just an idea of the pile. Um, if you're building a pile first off and you're trying to achieve this, this three foot high, Thing there, a lot of times uh, you'll see demonstrations where they show this layer cake of building of browns and greens and browns and greens and browns and greens, always having the browns on top so that you're suppressing the odor and whatnot. Um, but it's hard to uh, make those piles if you don't, you know, maybe it's not, you just sit there and look at it, but things don't always come together perfectly where you got a, a perfect layer of greens and a perfect layer of browns. So um, just get that pile together and then you can start turning it. Uh, if you are interested in some other ways of making compost, there are a number of do-it-yourself types of controlling your um, compost materials. You've got chicken wire cage, which is available at a lot of our uh, hardware stores. You can turn this into a uh, circle and fill it up, especially if you're dealing with like leaves. Uh, a lot of leaf composting works really well this way. You just pile those leaves up in that bin. Um, you can even target your, 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 your yard um, for where you want to use these and pile those leaves in that spot so that next spring it's ready to just open up the circle and, and uh, let everything spill out. If you have a, a 
drill and a garbage can you want to dedicate, you know, punch some holes in there and you can uh, set it on the ground and little critters will crawl up inside there from the ground so you can make your own little compost container that way. And of course, plastic bins can be used uh, to make worm bins and uh, it's actually quite popular. Uh, snow fencing. Um, there's different kinds of snow fencing out there. This one shows that metal picket stuff. And again, kind of like the chicken wire, you just make a kind of a cage and you pile all your stuff in there. Uh, had my dad learned about this, we probably would have had these little piles all over in the back, but probably not. That's too much work to put all those posts in the ground and circle it up. <laughs> uh, for those people that live um, around a construction site or you're really, really uh, industrious, uh, you want to make something that's going to last quite a while. Um, you can use cinder blocks uh, and make a uh, little corral um, or a, a stall, I guess, uh, for your, your compost. And again, this would be a way to control the size of it. So it would never get much bigger than the size of that, that, that corral that you create. And then going from there, we can get into making a bin system using pallets or even making a, a, a singular corral uh, out of pallets. Um, and again, these, these are materials that are becoming very popular to use. We see a lot of them down in our port around uh, a lot of businesses. Um, they're very approachable. Sometimes they have to pay to get rid of these. So, um, you know, you might be able to go and score some pallets uh, for next to nothing and start building away. Uh, but do, do realize that you're probably not the only person out there looking for these. So um, they're, they're a hot commodity. This is one of my favorite uh, compost bin systems. Um, and I believe we have a link to this from the Pierce Conservation District to build this three bin system. And I, I took and modified this so that it would, uh, you can actually sit on it quite better, uh, quite more, much more comfortably, sorry, poor English there, uh, much more comfortably. Uh, you can see the 32 inches high, uh, it makes it for a nice little sitting bench. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't get the 36 inches of depth. And uh, I, I made mine so that you could move it on the inside, um, kind of like a, I guess like a industrial conveyor line, if you will. But uh, again, this is just a basic um, beginning blueprint. And if you're creative and industrious, you can modify these um, wire systems and bin systems to fit your own needs. But I do like the three bin system. You can, uh, you can collect food in one bin, start turning it. The next bin is where you're gonna collect your next amount of food. Uh, once that gets full, you, know, you can start collecting in the third bin, be turning the second bin and be using the first bin. So it's kind of handy. And again, if you make it look nice, it's something that'll be um, appreciated in the yard too. Now when we get into tumblers, uh, this is a, a bit of a different use of that heat and air. Um, and it's, it, it uses the heat to actually create humidity on the inside. And so it traps the moisture in there because it, it's there. It's got some drainage and stuff, but it's, the whole idea with this is that it's kind of designed for you to put your food scraps in. And again, we're kind of limiting this. It's going to be uh, similar to a worm bin. It's going to be some kitchen scraps, food scraps, fruit peels and cores and things like that. Some, some yard waste that goes in here. Um, and you're, you're going to spin or turn or rotate this somehow. And as it tumbles, that's going to help with the, uh, the movement of the materials and break it down and help it get smaller. But it's really using a lot of the heat um, that gets in here. There's not a ton of microbes that get in there, except for what might be able to fly in. And trust me, you will have fruit flies with this system. Um, but in this one, you can see if you've got to stop at a certain point. This is, I learned a lesson on these, uh, one of the first ones I ever got. Um, I had to stop filling at a certain point and I, I just didn't. And so <laughs> I got to the very top, started to turn it and there was no room for the material to move. So it didn't matter how many times a day I turned it, it wasn't moving enough for any of the food on the inside to break down. So, you know, you wanna stop about halfway um, on these maybe three quarters at the most. Um, and then, you know, it's just turn, turn, turn every day until it doesn't look like what you put in there. Um, so, you know, it's going to take observation and looking at these and there's different kinds. So make sure that when you're looking at these, you think about your own body mechanics. Some of them pivot on their side, uh, the long way, some pivot on the short way. Um, you know, there's different kinds of tumblers out there. So you have to, uh, find one that works best for your body mechanics and fits the space that you have on your property as well. Again, it goes back to, uh, our poll question. 
So uh, at the Enviro House, we have different examples of these uh, there. Um, you can see we've got uh, this, this uh, green one up in the upper left corner. That's very popular, a lot of uh, community gardens. Um, I see the one on the right side, the black one is available at a lot of different stores around. Uh, my dad actually broke, uh, as my brother and I had moved out of the house, he actually shifted gears and he wanted to try doing some easier composting. Again, not turning a pile or anything like that. So the, um, the lower right-hand corner, uh, I believe those are called earth machines. And these were the composters my dad got. And uh, for all of our Doctor Who fans, they're very much like a Dalek out there. So my brother and I used to scream about how my dad just must have been a Doctor Who fan, but he was not, he didn't get that joke. But this is one where I really want you to pay attention to the body mechanics, because if you notice oh, that small little window uh, where the panel comes off on the front of it, that is where you will pull your food scraps out. So you will put them in the top, the top of the lid comes off, put your food scraps in there. The bottom is kind of like a, a plastic screen. So little worms and microbes and critters can crawl up from underneath there and eat away at the food. And then you're going to extract your compost from that small little window on the bottom. And um, so you wanna make sure that you check one of these out before you try it. Cause my dad um, was not into getting down that low and scooping that material out. So my brother found these buried in the backyard under um, various amounts of leaf litter. So <laughs> it was not my dad's favorite method at all. Uh, and the one possible on the, they they wrote they rose up and tried to exterminate right the, hey the I, I, <laughs> I think I think they did I think they did my dad actually rose up and said we're going to exterminate we're done right <laughs> um, um, and then on the, the left hand side is the one that I first used and learned my lesson you, you have to stop filling at some point um, I have a question it's an interesting one um, I inherited a stand-up compost bin with a vent on top I have been using it for a year but don't know how to use it as the instructions are in German are you familiar with this type of composter? How should I best utilize it? So without a picture, I think it's difficult, but I think the vent top, I, do you have an example of the, maybe one of those, uh, the cone ones maybe, or is this the? Oh, I don't have, I don't No, I don't have one of the cone ones. Um, but we do uh, have an the, earth cone at the house, at the Tacoma house. Yeah. Um, uh, well, so uh, the person let who me, asked let, that can question, I, let, yeah. Yeah, Let me ask ahead. a qualifier in that. Did it have an attached basket at the bottom of it that you would put in the ground? Okay, so uh, the person who asked that question, if you could ask yeah, a little more information, did it have an attached basket? Or if you can upload a picture, we could take a look at that. That'd be fantastic. So we'll stand by. Otherwise, I suggested maybe Google Google Translate that, that book. But <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe one of these looks kind of familiar to you. That'd be helpful. So. A lot of times those ones that have just a vent on top are meant to just kind of stand in one place. And then you fill it and let it do its thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, good luck believe, with that. We'll see. I believe we that brings us to our next poll question. Certainly does. Okay, if you are new or beginning, how do you feel about composting? Are you going to give it a try? There are things I can work with. Nothing new here. Other, that's for the newbies here. Like, you know, people like me aren't sure if we're going to get off the off the sofa today and go do that. <clears throat> but I think you know my biggest thing is we have dogs and. We have a lot of critters in our area, but um, containing that, like I'd love to just do the big pile like your dad does, but our yeah. dogs are going to get into every scrap of food in there. And and so the the three tiered or the three section bin is probably going to be the best with surrounding uh, on every side, you know. Well, and it's and honestly, even even in the city, um, because you can you can wire mesh that up. It's probably best because you know we do have a rodent issue. Even out here on my farm, I have a I have a serious rodent issue. So um, that is going to be um, prevalent if you just throw a pile out there. So dogs, rats, cats. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot that, of raccoons. <laughs> raccoons, yeah, for sure, for sure. You want to find out if you got possum in the neighborhood, for sure. Start start that way too. Right. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the polling here. Let's take a look at what people have to say. Excellent, looks like everyone, a lot of other people are willing to give it a try. Right on. And the difficulty, one person, the difficulty for me is getting enough brown material. Interesting. That, yeah, that can be a, a bit of an issue, especially, you know, if we have smaller yards, um, you know, maybe not as many trees, uh, that, that can be a bit of a challenge there. Um, this is where, you know, your paper materials, uh, financial documents can be a good substitute for browns. 
um, that kind of thing. You can talk to neighbors and see about, you know, collecting some of their leaves in the fall. Or if you've got friends that have, uh, you know, pets that they have bedding material, you can maybe borrow some of that and help them out with theirs. Now, John, in Tacoma, in the recycle bin, they don't accept shredded paper. That's correct, right? Correct. Is shredded paper good for this? Like you said, financial documents, are we? Oh, yeah. No. Standard printout stuff is, you know, shredded is good? Shredded is good. Uh, again, you know, uh, you want to watch out for, it. like, well, if you work in, in any set of business where you might have heavily redacted materials, a lot of times that uh, that marker material is is still of a toxic nature. So um, those kinds of materials I would probably watch out for. But if we're, if we're talking about, you know, just your, your home shred um, and you can't get rid of it anymore in Tacoma, the, the, the compost bin is a, is a great way to go. Excellent. Um, I have a couple of questions about odor and fruit flies. Um, yeah. Fruit flies are bad in the summer. I know we have a problem with our tumbler, but uh, you have a way to keep those at bay. And then the odor suppression, any thoughts on that? And then I got a comment about the German composter. So we'll get to that in a second. Cool. Um, with the, um, the tumblers, it's a, it's a tough one to manage because they're, they're trapping their own moisture in there. Um, but if you, if you keep, uh, keep active on turning it um, and, and maybe throw some, some paper in there, some, some brown materials in there to help absorb some of the moisture, because a lot of times things start to smell bad because there's, it's going anaerobic. So it's not getting oxygen. It might be that there's too much moisture in there um, and the air can't flow through. So um, paper will help to absorb some of that moisture. And, uh, and if, you, if it's a tumbler and you throw that paper in there, it's going to help to kind of integrate that paper and, and hopefully create more, more air pockets. Uh, as far as the fruit flies go, that, that, that's a challenging one um, because they, they just are so attracted to that, that product, that, that breaking down of food. Um, so it's, it's either you set up fruit fly traps or you kind of figure out how to, how to accept it. On the outside compost pile though, um, fruit flies can be kept at bay uh, by making sure that you always have brown materials on top. Um, and so if you can always make sure to keep it covered and it's a challenge in the winter, but we don't have too many fruit fly problems in the winter per se. But in the summer months or the shoulder seasons, um, keeping like leaf litter, grass clippings, dried grass clippings in particular, um, even you know if you have old compost uh, that you can cover the top of it with. Um, that's a way to kind of keep those fruit flies and the smell out that away. And the outside pile, um, if you have smells there, you need to investigate a couple of things. Is it an imbalance of nutrients? Do I have too many green materials in there? Um, is it too wet? Uh, has it gotten cold? Um, so once you can kind of figure out those things, then you can start to address the different factors and, and try to bring it back and correct and balance. Excellent. I have a real quick, uh, in regards to the German composter, it looks similar to the bottom right ones that were pictured. Those are probably the little Dalek ones. Has a door in the bottom and a vent on top. Not sure if you want to, if I need to vent. Also, I have no way to turn it. So the one on the lower right, yeah, that looks like it's one of those ones. Um, the vent, is the vent on top, like, uh, it sounds like the vent on top might be where you actually add your, your ingredients to the, the bin itself. Uh, sounds very much like that one where it's kind of in place. You're not turning it. Um, it's just going to be a time a time factor. Um, every once in a while, you'll have to look in the bottom of that and see if it's broken down. And again, this is one of those ones where you want to make sure that you you stop putting stuff in there at a certain point and uh, switch over to the other bin so that you know it, it can start collecting and one bin can start doing work. Otherwise, it's it, it should seem like a perpetual machine, but you know it's, it's just a weird weird design concept. but there are a multitude of tumblers and bins out there. So this is just one variation of it. And sorry, those instructions are so hard to understand. So I think Gator had to step away a second. Sorry, I don't think we had a poll question there, right? No, we already ended the poll question. We're, this is okay. just our resource portion now here. And uh, I was Thanks actually- back. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, just the, I got a few more slides here that are just basically our resource list. Um, it's more information. And then I was just going to open it up to any final questions. 
Yeah, go for it. And there's a link to the Earth Machine right there. So if anybody's wanting to see more about that one. And again, don't forget this is recorded. So if there's anything you missed or anything you want to pause on, once we get it up online, which should take about a week, cross our fingers, um, you can go back and look at those. And we'll have those resources available uh, elsewhere. Here's a list of good books. Uh, the uh, Worms Eat My Garbage uh, is a is a great book. There's uh, um, yeah, lots of great information in there. Uh, chicken, chicken waste is uh, is that a positive to throw in there? Yeah, um, it is a hot product though, so it's like a high nitrogen product. So it's it's a great place to put it and help to cool it down some. Um, chicken manure right into uh, your beds you would burn out little seedlings as they sprouted so uh, it's really good to try to um, temper temper that with the compost pile so uh, I, I think it's a great place for it to go and again you're just uh, pumping those nutrients um, uh, right back into those little microbes that'll benefit from it It'll be stinky, uh, so you definitely want to make sure that you're you're turning it. Don't just throw that in there and walk away and expect magic to happen without uh, getting in there. Otherwise, it's, it's, yeah, you're, you're gonna you'll start to smell that pretty quickly. But definitely compost that chicken manure for sure. Um, there's a build question here since you're our MacGyver of the group. Um, if we try to use a plastic bin to compost, should we drill holes all the way all throughout the tub or just in the lid, like was in that diagram? And I imagine with a garbage can, plastic garbage can or a garbage can composter, is it just in the sides or do we need something in the bottom to allow things to get in and out or drainage? So, so uh, when it comes, to, okay, so this is, this is a good one. I learned this on a, uh, making a worm bin. Um, you, can, you can actually put too many holes around the edge and it will just lose structural integrity. Um, so, you know, don't Swiss cheese it. Um, you know, you want it to keep some rigidity to it. So, um, you know, make sure that you're just um, putting the, row, the holes in around in a kind of a evenly spaced uh, way. And then you can put a few holes in the bottom for sure. And the nice thing about doing the holes in the bottom is that it helps drain off excess moisture. Um, so with doing that, it does kind of mean you do have to pay attention to the moisture content a little bit more so and make sure it's not getting too dry. So, I mean, if it starts to dry it a little bit, um, you know, little hose or sprinklage, that, that, that's that's great for keeping it damp and keeping those little critters happy. So along that line also, um, the Enviro House is closed, but the grounds are open. So you can stop and walk and look at the uh, bins on the outside. Um, but we also have, if you're a city of Tacoma resident, we do have a bin that's a very basic wraparound plastic with holes with a top and bottom, just wing nut fastens together. Um, we're selling that leftover from a project that the city did a few years ago and we had those left over. Um, so those are pretty inexpensive compared to what you buy online. I think it's like $35 for one. Um, if you are interested in that, I can you can email me at ehouse at cityoftacoma.org and I can follow up with you on that. Um, I don't take cash for that, which is why I can't offer it to anybody outside the city because that goes on your, um, unless you're a utility customer, it goes out on your utility bill as a charge. But you can follow up with me about that. Um, the other thing is that we do have how-to videos that we did with John um, last year that show the, those bins at the Enviro House. And there's also a how-to video on, um, how to do worm composting that John did with us. So you can find those at um, <clears throat> youtube.com forward slash city of Tacoma forward slash playlists. And then you just look for, there's a lot of different videos. So you look for the playlist for how to or for some of our recorded webinars on there also. Um, we have a question here, John, uh, one last one. My compost pile is so big, it's hard to turn over. It is built with plywood panels, so I don't want to tear it apart. Is there a way to easily turn it now? That's a, to me, is kind of one of those like, yeah, I got to the point where it's just too big to handle. Like, right? 
too big to handle. Uh, you, you, you just need to start tackling it in small shovel holes. <laughs> Um, do you recommend like taking bits and moving it to another location to like kind of that take it off the top stir that take the next pile stir it and then kind of eventually bring it back yeah you, you you know try to try to um you know probably at the core of the pile there's probably been a lot of great composting going on so you know if you could you know uh kind of part the pile a little bit and get at the core of it um you know you, you might be able to reduce its size and, and get to the usable the usable portions and put those out uh, now and, and use it and then try to yeah try to either move it into another spot I know it gets tough when we make something in just the right spot and, um, but when it gets out of control and away from us then we just aren't using it at all and then it becomes another another problem just sitting there um, because you'll just be tempted to keep throwing stuff on it. So it's better to try to split it, see what you can get at as far as good compost at the core of it, use it, put it out there, distribute it, um, and then and then try to split that pile up. Maybe create another another bin next to where you've, you've got it if you can. Excellent. Well, why don't we uh, stop there and say, John, thank you so much. It's always informative uh, to learn all these, you know, it's the details, you know, the devil's in the details, but just knowing that you have that thermometer to check the center of it. And so you know what you're looking for is, is just great. Um, so awesome. thank you so much, Janda. Uh, we mentioned all those ones, those webinars coming up next week and coming in April with the Earth Day. Uh, you want to tell us anything else? Catch us up on anything. Um, just as a reminder on the heat pump is on the 27th, heat pumps and water heat pump, water heaters and um, food gardens. Um, on April 3rd. Um, and then we're still trying to get the rest of the April ones balanced. There's, we will be doing electric vehicles again. Um, we'll be doing, at the end of April, the last week, we'll be doing one with an introduction to the tool library, which has moved to the Tacoma Public Library spot. And um, they've had more space, so they've added more tools. And they will be doing a whole overview on what they have, how you can use them. Um, up until this week, they were taking orders and delivering tools. As of this week, and we move into a new phase with the coronavirus, um, they're setting up appointments where you can actually come into the library and pick up the tools. Um, but it is a great resource. and. Um, we will be doing a video on that. There will be um, a fabric uh, recycling event where you can bring fabrics and thread and various things like that um, to the recycle center. That's being worked out. So a lot of different things that are going to be happening um, in April. So, and most of that will be on the City of Tacoma Sustainability um, Facebook page and their calendar. So check those Excellent. out. Excellent. Um, John, thank you again. Uh, everyone, thank you. Reminder that this will be available hopefully sooner. You'll get an email hopefully to, to tell you when it's available on YouTube uh, on the Enviro House webpage. Otherwise, check out the former, the past webinars and look forward to future. Don't forget to register for those early. Um, a thing about the heat pump, remember it's cold now, but it's going to be warmer this summer and the heat pump also works as an air conditioner is my understanding. Yeah. It's kind of a new thing, so. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, John and Janda, I sent you a link to the meeting afterwards. We can do a post-mortem of this. Okay. Awesome. Everybody else, I'm gonna end this meeting. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for more. Bye. <laughs>